All right, so hi, I'm Nancy with On Point TV. Today we're going to talk about Storm at Sea quilts. I do see that we've got some Linda from Arkansas. I loved that quilt you made, Linda. It was in the opening roll. I don't know if you saw it on there or not, but Linda made a Storm at Sea with a really cool colorization. No, if I gotta go this way, where the stars, instead of being white, were gold. Love, love, love that idea. I see that we've got somebody from Oregon and New Jersey and a, just a great hello in Southwest Ohio. Not sure what it's like in Southwest Ohio right now, but I gotta tell you, it is six o'clock in the evening in Michigan, and I swear to you, it feels like I'm in Texas in August. It is hot out there. We're like hitting 90 for days in a row, which kind of is okay, except for that, like I just got finished working at the greenhouse. And if you think 90 is hot in regular life, try 90 in a greenhouse. That's a whole nother something. Hello from Virginia and Iowa. A couple of you from Iowa. Hi, you guys from Iowa. So we're going to do Storm at Sea today. The one behind me, the red, white, and blue one, is in process. The reason I'm concentrating on Storm at Sea today is because my quilt guild, the West Michigan Quilters Guild, um, is planning their quilt show for April 1st and 2nd of 2022. And our raffle quilt will be a storm at sea, the one that you see behind me. Now, the reason that we're doing it a storm at sea every time we do a different quilt and stuff, but it's because our quilt show is going to be kind of centered on quilts of valor, honoring our veterans. So different people in the guild who have been veterans and our veterans home and family members of guild members, we're going to do the whole presentations and stuff of the quilts as you go, the quilts of valor quilts, which are obviously all red, white, and blue. And so the one behind me will be one one of our raffle quilts. So our bees always make quilts too. Um, New Zealand, yeah. Oh, it's 10 a.m. and freezing. Yeah, that sounds really nice right about now. <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness, everybody's talking. Yeah, it's hot in Ontario. All right, and Pennsylvania. Hello, everybody. All right, so the Storm at Sea. This is the Storm at Sea pattern that I just finished writing earlier this week. It has two different sizes. So it has the patterns, the, um, the paper piecing, there you go, the paper piecing templates for the large size and for the miniature size. I'll talk to you a little bit more about the coloring on the miniature size. I was not happy with the way that turned out, and I'll show you um, what I maybe could have done better with that. But for those of you that are Quilt Addict members, you should already have gotten this in your email. It comes as an e-pattern. So if you're a Quilt Addict member, that means that you get every pattern that I make, you get it before everybody else. So I sent it out yesterday. Now, if you are a Quilt Addict member and you did not get this in your email, that means I don't have your email. There are two people on that list. I don't have your email. I would love to start sending you all of the books that you should have gotten up till now, but I can't because I don't have your email. So if you're a Quilt Addict member, please send me your email. Send it to quiltingwithnancy at gmail.com. Also, if you're an any member at all, a beginner member, a design level, or an addict member, um, be sure I get your email. If you have not gotten the invite to be um, part of the Facebook Quilting with Nancy members only page, and you want to, then go ahead and send me your email. Um, if you're a design level, then you also need to send me your email so I can send you the Zoom link because we do a Zoom class once a month on how to use electric quilt. Um, Somebody just said, Jim just said that it hit 100. It's just really, really hot in this whole area right now. Um, um, not that I'm wishing for spring by any means, but hot is hot. But I've been working in my sister's greenhouse. 90 in normal life is hot. Get in a greenhouse and it's 110, just like that. It gets really hot. So we're going to start with the storm at sea. So before we start, I want to talk to you about what tools I use. So the tools that I use, we're going to start with the paper. I love the papers for foundation piecing by that patchwork place, which is Martingale. They're a publisher. You've probably seen um, lots and lots of their books. This is my favorite paper. Why this paper? Because it makes it possible and easy to tear off as much of the paper as possible. So it also goes through your copy machine. So let's say that you get the book and you get the book and you want to make your copies. So let's see, let me see where it's at. 
There we go. You want to make the copies? You can just click on the PDF that you get when you purchase the book and say, I want to print this page, page 17, right onto your foundation papers. And I've also told you how many you need to um, print for each one of the quilts. If you're making the queen size, the twin size, the mini, or the crib. The second tool is the add a quarter rulers. Let me see, can you read that? I don't know if you can. Let's try it this way. Uh, nope, you still can't read it. It's etched into the ruler and it says add dash, oh, now you can, add a quarter. There you go. Before the add a quarter ruler, I hated paper piecing because it was so messy and it was so inaccurate and just everything about it. Really, really hated it. A student, and this was 25 years ago or so, introduced me to the, I think it was that long, introduced me to the original add a quarter, which is a six inch. Today, I'm going to use both the six inch and the 12 inch. The entire project can be done with the six inch. The 12 inch just makes it a little bit easier. Then there is the big 18 inch. And I got to tell you, I haven't used it yet. As you can see, it is still in the package. But my learning to quilt two series is going to have a Mariner's Compass right in the middle of it. And that is going to be when I'll be using this big one. Then there are some other ones. Now there's an add a quarter, that new add a quarter plus has a tapered edge. And I don't know, it's probably, there, hey, all right, you can see it. There's this tapered edge. I'm going to show you different ways of folding on the paper. And with the tapered edge, then that just makes it a little bit easier. Now these are both the add an eight. And what that means is that there's a little ledge that I'm going to show you how to use that is only an eighth of an inch wide. This one, obviously, is a quarter of an inch wide. Why would you need to have an eighth of an inch wide? For if you're doing a miniature quilt. Now, for the little purple one behind me, I did not use the add an eighth. It wasn't necessary. The seams were not small enough that I needed a smaller than normal quarter inch seam allowance. But when I made this quilt, this quilt is a pineapple Lone Star. And this little pineapple section in here, whoops, I'm seeing myself backwards, like pointed in a mirror. Let's try that. Those are just a smidgen bit over an eighth of an inch. So when I made this one, which was done in paper piecing, I did use the add an eighth. So that's why you may or may not need to have one of all of these, maybe just one, maybe five, I don't know. Just know that they're there, all right? So to start with, let's get ourselves organized here. We're going to start, oh, the other tools. I'm going to be using YooHoo glue stick. YooHoo is an acid-free glue stick. I know there's lots of glue sticks on the market. This is just the one that I like best. It seems to do what I need it to do when I need it to do it and hold as much as I want it to hold. Then I'm going to use a smaller than normal. I'm going to use the 28 millimeter rotary cutter. This is the um, 60 millimeter. Normally I use a 45. This one is a 28. And for paper piecing, this is the best one to use. Um, probably going to need a seam ripper. This is Acorn Precision Piecing Products. This is the seam align glue. I'm going to show you why you may want to use this. You may not want to use this, but for people that struggle with the placement in paper piecing, I think this is really, really nice. Now, somebody asked me last time, would it be the same as using Roxanne's glue base? The Roxanne's glue um, dries a little bit slower. This one dries quicker than the Roxanne's, but the Roxanne's is stronger, which is why I want Roxanne's for the, re for the applique and the Celtic designs and things like that that I use the Roxanne's for. So the precision seam align, line, seam, a line glue is just perfect for things like this. I had a student just the other day that was, we were working on a Lemoyne star and she was having trouble getting the two little points to line up. And one of the other students said, Hey, Nancy, how about, and I was like, Oh my goodness. I never thought about it. Made all the difference to her. Everything just kind of fell right in place for her. So the alignment glue, that's what it's going to be for. Okay. Um, hi, hi. Everybody's saying hello. Hello from Kentucky. So we're going to start 
with, and I'm only going to make the large one. I'll talk to you a little bit about the small one, but we're going to get started. So to start with, you're going to take and make copies of your design. So this is the large design, and the largest block is seven and a half inches. You want to guess why I made it seven and a half inches? So it could print on one sheet. There you go. There was my thought process right there. You want to trim out your paper design a quarter of an inch bigger than the design. Well, heavens to Betsy, how about using your add a quarter ruler for that? The add a quarter ruler has that quarter inch lip. Lay that on the line, trim it off. I have this little guy ready to piece. Now, what I would normally like to do right now is to use my light box. So I've got a small light box from Daylight. I normally have it on. I flip my paper over onto the back side. Then I take what is my center square and I glue it down. So I just kind of go around the perimeter with a little bit of glue and then I can see right through it to see where to place it. All right, I want everybody to close your eyes. This is why we're not going to use the light box today because it doesn't make it any, you can't see. You can, I can see, you can, okay, you can just barely see. But when you use a light box, the placement of the center square in particular and some of the other ones coming along just makes it easier. So not going to use the light box. I'm just going to use my own eyes. Let's put that down under here. All right, so our first guy is in place. Now, all of these pieces have been cut a little bit larger because you just never know about the placement. So since it's been cut a little bit larger, the first thing I need to do, and you'll notice why I wanted that glued down, look at, ah, 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 see, it stays in place. Now I'm gonna use just a piece of cardboard. I just cut this off of a um, bottom of a pad of paper. I'm gonna line it up on the sew lines around the center square. Gonna line that up there, fold it back on the card, use my add a quarter ruler and trim. So now I have a quarter of an inch of, of blue sticking out past the seam line. And I'm gonna do that all the way around this block. Now, when I do this, I usually will glue, oh, I don't know, about 10 at a time. And then I trim, oh, about 10 at a time. So that I've kind of got all the tools that I need for doing each one of these steps ready to go. Oops, didn't quite get that one. I was thinking today I should have got changed my blade. Yeah, best laid plans of mice and men. All right, there, now we're trimmed off. And you need to trim it because you need to know where to place your triangle units. Now the triangle units, I'm gonna start with a white one, but I do wanna tell you that you're gonna take your squares and you're going to cut them on the diagonal once. This is going to create the triangle unit that you need to position here. Why not, why? Because I've had some people turn in their blocks already and they didn't do it this way. Instead, they took a square piece of fabric, placed it on, sewed it, and then they cut it like that. What's wrong with that? Everybody want to raise your hands to tell me what is wrong with doing it this way, especially for the outside triangles? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Come on, anybody want to tell me? All right, I'll tell you, and then maybe somebody's typing it right now. The problem is that you have a bias edge here, and we don't want a bias edge here, and definitely not on the outside edge of the block. So you want to take a square, which would, in all intents and purposes, this is a corner square, like as if you were putting a quilt on point, and you want to, thank you, Nanette, you answered it. Don, you answered it. Good job, guys. <laughs> you want to take it and cut it on the diagonal. So now when we place it down and then we flip it up, it is going to have straight of grain on the edges. And that's going to be really, really important on the edge of the quilt. Right. So we've got this done. Now we're going to take the precision glue. So when it comes to doing the large blocks like this, I just take two, three dots of precision glue, beep, 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 
And again, I would work in about 10 blocks at a time. So I'd put the glue down, and I'll show you how I do that in a little bit, and then set it down, and it dries as I'm getting the other ones ready. So when I go to my sewing machine, it's all ready. So we're going to go to the sewing machine now. You might have noticed that I did not have my pincushion on. There's my pincushion that is normally on my wrist. I can't because when I go to sew, it gets in the view. So it's hard enough to sew the way that I've got this all set up, but we don't have a pincushion. So we're going to start here. I have set my stitch length up to a 1.5. I also have put on my open toe applique foot so that I can just see a little bit better. Here is my normal foot and there's, you know, the clear plastic in between it. There is a solid line right down the middle. So technically I could place that on the line to know where to go. But I tell you, having the open toe applique foot, I think just makes it easier to see. Along with doing things a little differently when I'm on video, when I'm making the 10 or so that I make at a time of these, I normally chain piece, but I can't do that on video either. It's just too bulky. So right here at this point, if I were doing chain piecing, I would lift my presser foot, I would pull this forward, and then I would start stitching on this next one. But instead, I'm just going to use my thread cutter and cut that thread off. Whoops. Uh, let's try that one more time. Sorry, that was my arm in your face. Now we're taking it back to the cutting surface. Usually when I'm doing this at home too, I'm going to set up everything to be really close to my machine. So I will have, let me cut these little guys off before they drive me crazy. I will actually have my sewing machine here and then I will have my cutting surface just to my left so that I can sew spin, press, cut, sew, spin, press, cut. And then to my right is where I have my, um, my light board so that when I'm trying to get positioning straight, I'll have that right there. So I can jute, jute, jute. Sometimes I'm sitting for so long that my new Apple watch will tell me time to stand. You've been sitting too long. So yes, probably I've been sitting too long, but just so you know, that's how I do it. So it's very, very convenient. Once you get them sewn down, the next step is to press them open. Now, I like to use my Clover Mini Iron. For me, this works great. Everything is just going to be laid down perfectly when I use the little Clover. Now, people are right now freaking out, thinking that I'm damaging my cutting mat. I am not damaging my cutting mat. I'm just going over top of it like that, and I've never had that hurt my mat. The other method is to flip it up and try to scrape it or to finger press it. Um, Teresa, just so you know, that really wrecks with your manicure because she mentioned she liked my nails. It also doesn't get these little guys to lay down flat enough. So I like to use my Clover Mini Iron. There we go. Okay. Now the next step for this block is really quite simple. I do not have to trim off these little ears. See these little ears? I don't have to trim them off. I can leave them right there. When you are doing the smaller block that I'll try and show you in a little bit, then you do have to trim those off. But for the big block, you don't. Now I'm going to use my precision glue. And I'm going to go one, two, three and place them. Another thing you want to keep in mind, and I've got to draw this for you to see it because you can't see through the paper. This is the design that I'm trying to fit into. See that? And now I can see it through the paper and you know you can barely just see it down here. It's very important that you line up the point with the point of where the design is going. So making this point be right down the middle of the block is very, very important. So I'm going to glue two down at a time. One, two, three. You know, it's surprising how long this little bottle has lasted too. It's really, I mean, it goes a long way. And then you're only using a couple of dots at a time anyway. So I'm going to let that dry a little bit as I show you something. Oops, here we go. On the little one, I've been talking to you about the little one. The little one is the same idea, except it's got a smaller square. These are the cornerstones in the entire quilt. So if you look 
at the quilt behind me, the, no, these are the cornerstones. These are the small blocks. So this is your large block, your small cornerstones, and then this is your sashing. So here you've got the square that would go on there. I would glue that down, trim it. And then when you're doing the small one, you can only do one triangle, inner triangle at a time. So I glue this, sew this. You can't put both of them down like I did with the blue because this little guy is too close. You have to wait till he's sewn and pressed before you can put him on. So it's not harder. It just is kind of like an extra step. And then I mentioned, after you get those two on with the little black, you need to trim these little ears off. Because if you don't, let's see if I can see it. I don't think I can. I'm going to draw it. This is your seam line right here. And those little ears go past the seam line. So when I get it to that point, I just take my scissors and cut them off. All right? You don't have to use your add a quarter at that point. Just fold back, cut them off, and then you'll be ready to place your next triangle on. Okay? So that's the little one. Going back to the big one, and I had to do that little like intermission because I needed this to dry. So, Teresa, you can get the pattern on onpoint-tv.com. That is my website. All right, going back to the sewing machine. Again, going to start right at the, oh, I didn't mention that last time. I'm going to start right at the design line. I am not going to start a quarter of an inch past the design line. I'm going to start right here. That is important because when it comes time for the next step, you need to be able to fold on that design, on the next design line. And if you sew past it, you can't. So if you go one, maybe two stitches past, Eh, that's not a big deal. But if you go much more than that, it makes it more difficult to fold them back. I'm making sure my fabric is not flipping backwards as I go. All right, going to get this guy done. And cut the thread. Cut off the threads because... I don't know. I hope you guys all cut your threads off as you go. For me, it's a you know short trip to the loony bin if there's lots of threads hanging out all over the place. And it is such a short trip. All right. So here I go again. I'm going to press this over. Now, the next time I sew on the triangles, I'm going to tell you to start off the edge of the design. For these triangles and for any time I'm doing paper piecing, the inside design lines, I start on the line. But when it's an outside design line, I sew off, I start off the edge, and I'll show you that. And the reason is if you start on the design line with the edge ones, you're, the edge of the block is not secured. You'll have all these little guys flopping all over the place. So just trust me on that. After you've sewn down your first set of triangles, it's time to trim. Laying down your add a quarter and cut. Laying down your add a quarter and cut. I'm wondering if I have this next step ready. I think I actually do. So I'm going to trim all the way around that block. There we go. So that we will then be ready to put on our next triangles. Now this guy I just pinned in place so you could see him, this guy glued. So you're going to put on the top and the bottom triangle, then you're going to flip it around, and you're going to add these two triangles. So this guy is already glued down. This guy, he has a longer seam, so I'm going to put five drops of glue. Ooh, I'm going all out, going to use five drops of glue. And place that, and again, I'm trying to center him up. So his point is lined up with the design point. And to get that glue to dry just a smidge bit faster, because I'm not doing more than just these ones. There we go. going to flip him over and go to the machine. So this is where I was talking about starting on the outside edge. For the first triangle, I already did it. I started sewing here, 
and continued down this line. Now I'm going to start here off the edge. So into the design, I'll make sure my fabric isn't flipped wrong. Oh, it was. I might have a tro I might have a problem here. Uh, let me cut the thread. I'm Houston, we might have a problem. Did I? Oh, nope, I didn't. Shoot. All right. It was just to the point where it was just going to get bunched up underneath. And honestly, you can tell that by just how it feels. When you've done enough of them, you'll be able to feel when your fabric is flipped up wrong. Um, stop. Sorry, I'm using my start and stop button. Start and stop button instead of a foot pedal. And here's my next one. So I'm feeling the fabric underneath. And I can feel that there's not anything bunched up underneath it. Um, you know, some people might want to pin it like off to the side a little bit to make sure that it doesn't get folded up. And, and that's an idea. Honestly, the pins just always seem to get in the way to me. All right. So we are back here. Let me get this guy way, way, way out of the way. I didn't get him very far out of the way, sorry. Okay, I'm going to press him now. Now it looks like an economy block, a square and a square block. Lots of different names that it has. This one in most circles nowadays is called a square and a square block, but it used to be called economy block, and that's what some of the people are started to use again. So anyway, to each his own. After I get it to this far, the next thing I want to do is press it with some Mary Ellen's Best Press. I put my Best Press in the spray bottle like this. It's kind of a mister. I'm not going to do it because my iron's on the other side of the room and I can't put it on here. It's too hot. Um, but using the mister is going to give you a light covering on your fabric that is going to get all of these seams to be really, really crisp, just like we want them, without totally saturating the paper. Now, there's sometimes I'm doing paper piecing that I want that, but this is not one of them. For this, I don't want to saturate this completely. So using a mister bottle is just going to help you keep everything nice and flat without over-saturating it. Right. Now, you're going to make a few of these, then you're going to make a few of the little red ones, and you will be, I don't know, a good chunk of the way to getting your quilt done. But now is the most difficult block. The sashings with those elongated diamonds and those elongated triangles are really the most complicated of all of them. I think the economy block is pretty self-explanatory, but the sashing ones, not so much. So let me show you what I've done with the pattern. So starting with the sashing, this is the entire size of the sashing. In this case, it's like seven and a half inches. You're going to cut your diamond fabric full size. So if your sashing is two by four, cut your diamond fabric two by four. If your sashing is three by nine, cut your sashing three by nine. Um, this one I think is three and a half by seven. Cut the sashing fabrics that exact size. I tried to come up with a way that you could just cut strips and then cut diamonds. The truth of the matter is, is these diamonds are not a 45, a 30, a 60 angle. It's like some, I don't know, odd angle that only scientists ever use, not quilters. So I couldn't figure it out. So the most foolproof way to do it is to cut it the full size. Then you're going to take and glue that. And I like to really glue this on the edges here. So only gluing it in the diamond. No, 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 not on the edges, just in the diamond. Um, does the fabric shrink when best pressed like it does when using starch? All depends on the fabric that you're using, Irene. Um, I'm generally going to be using high quality quilting fabric, which in today's world means 11 to 12 bucks a yard. When you buy cheap fabric, and I bet you buy the most expensive fabric you can, I'm just telling you that cheap fabric is definitely going to shrink more. And before I usually start pressing things like this, I've probably pressed it a couple times, so it's already done any shrinking that it's going to. But yes, if you're spraying this on heavy, it will shrink the fabric. It kind you know, when I, if you go back to my Sunset Over Dublin 
quilt that I just did. For that quilt, I pre-dunked all of my fabrics. I took my half yards of fabrics and I pre-dunked them in Mary Ellen's Best Press and then pressed them all so they're almost as stiff as paper. And for that quilt, it was fabulous. Oh my gosh, it was just so wonderful having everything be that stiff. For this quilt, yeah, you could do it. Um, I don't know that it would make a huge bit of difference, but would it hurt it? No, certainly wouldn't hurt it and make everything lay nice and crisp in the process. So yes, they will shrink it, but it kind of depends on the fabric you're using too, okay? All right, so back to business. So I gotta put more glue on now. So I'm putting the glue down in the diamond area, on the edges of the diamond area, then I'm gonna lay my square rectangle down on top of the entire area. Now I'm gonna go to the paper side and trim just like I did if I could find my piece of cardboard I was gonna trim anyway. Anybody see it? There it is. I can just see somebody. You're welcome. Somebody going, yes, Nancy, I saw you put it over there in that pile. So I'm gonna line it up with the diamond, fold it back, and trim. And I will be trimming off quite a few of these. Now, to some, that might look like wasted fabric, but the truth is I cannot find another way to do it and get these diamonds the size I need without a lot of hassle and knowing angles that just are not, you know, in my vocabulary. So viewing the full piece is just so, so, so much easier. Okay. And last one. Now this is where if you're going to be using the glue, I found this to be the best time to use it. So you're going to take your, uh, there it is. You're gonna take your long rectangles. I have you cut some long rectangles and just like with the half square triangles, you're going to cut it on the diagonal. So then you will have the long triangles that you need to go around uh, this one, to go around the diamond, all right? And they're cut. Um, I don't know what other patterns do. I know that I figured out just the right size that you needed to be able to cut it to make this work. So that's what my pattern has. And this, like I mentioned, if you're gonna use the glue, this would really be the time because these guys being elongated like they are does make it a little bit harder to handle. So we are gonna go to the sewing machine because when I sew these ones, there's only the um, one seam going all the way around. So when you do the first seam, you can start just on the de diamond design line, but you can sew all the way off too. So when I was doing it and I was chain piecing, I was sewing all the way off. And for me, because I was chain piecing, that made it easier but it did make it a little harder to pull off the paper. So I'm kind of torn. If I'm chain piecing, yes. I'm gonna start off the paper, I'm gonna end off the paper on these first initial lines. But if I'm not gonna chain piece like I'm doing here, I might actually just stop inside the design. So on those points. So I had started right on the diamond and I sewed off the diamond and again there it is I started on the diamond edge and then sewed all the way off the edge but you don't have to um, when I was doing them earlier when I made all the blocks that I made I did it because I was chain piecing and that makes it so much easier to chain piece so now we're gonna press this one. Oh my goodness I forgot to mention all right I'll do it Whoa! okay excuse me please my iron fell. I have it in a big mug, but it still fell because I tipped it. All right. When you are placing these diamonds, remember how I told you to trim your design a quarter of an inch all the way around the design? That is so important when it comes to this block because with this block, you need to, you're gonna take this elongated diamond I'm sorry, triangle, and flip it down. You need the fat point, this little guy right here, let me see if we can go close enough. You need this point to go a quarter of an inch past 
the design line. The design line, edge of the design line, is right there. You need the point to go past the design line. Otherwise, you'll end up missing the corners of the fabric. This was also the block that for those guild members that made it using just like a rectangle, this made it really difficult because the edges were all stretchy bias going all the way around. Was I able to make it work? Well, of course I was able to make it work. Um, I just was really gentle and I didn't stretch things and, you know, that kind of idea. But you doing it this way with the elongated triangles just makes it so that it doesn't do any stretching on the edge. It's really just perfect. All right? So I'm just drying those off. And this time I would sew those from the very edge. I would start here and sew all the way off the edge on both of those and chain piecing. And what that gets you is this. So he's all done. I know he's got these funny little ears here, but you'll see that I definitely sewed off the edge here because this is secure. If you start on the diamond, this little guy flip flops around. That's not going to be fun. I've taken this and I already did the spray sizing for it. So now it's time to trim it. You want to trim it to the outside edge, but be very, very careful. Sometimes in the process of spray sizing it, sometimes in the copies that you make, the paper might not be the correct size. So when you get your, does your, um, pattern, when you get your pattern and you flip to the pages and you're ready to pr um, print them, check with your printer. I don't know why. I don't know whose bright idea this was, but it wasn't a quilter's. They decided that most printers are going to print 97% size, not 100%. 97% is smaller than 100%. So check your printer. If it talks to you about the sizing or whatever that would be thing, um, tell it to be 100%. And even with that, you now want to make your test with your ruler what size it actually is. So this block is supposed to be three and a half by seven, by eight inches at this point. Three, because it finishes three by seven. All right, my design is pretty darn close. It might be a little bit small. So I'm going to set it so that it is actually the size I need it. That might mean that my seam allowance is a little bit bigger, but that is better than having the block too small. And if my seam allowance is a little bit bigger, well, heavens to Bessie, that means I won't cut off any points. And I think that is a good thing too. So trimmed that. Oops, I moved there a little bit. Let me dry that one more time. There. Doop. Okay. So now it is trimmed down to the size. Now it's time to tear off the paper. I tear off the paper in the reverse order that I put it on. So this was one of the last ones I put on. I'm going to take and fold that back. Doop. And then carefully tear off the paper. And you always tear off the paper before you start sewing it into the quilt. Then I'm going to go to the opposite side and tear off the paper. And then these sides. And then what I found, I found this hand, one of these tools that, you know, the ones that have been sitting in my studio for a long time and I forget they're there. And this one, I always have trouble with the name of it. It's the, there it is. It's this little guy from Clover. It's a H-E-R-A. Uh, scaling. Thank you. Yes, it was a scaling. Make sure that the scaling on the copies is 100%. Thank you very much, Rich. All right. Because I did that gluing down of the glue stick, if you take a tool like this and run it inside there, I find that it makes it so that the paper has not stuck to the fabric so much. Is it a huge problem if it sticks to the fabric? No, it's not a huge problem, but just using that little tool takes care of it so that it doesn't happen anymore. Now, when I made the big one, I'm going to try and flip up a corner here. I pressed the seams in opposite directions. So if I were making a quilt with blocks, I would press always to the sashings. So the blocks to the sashings, the cornerstones to the sashings. 
And that worked pretty good. It is a little bit bulky, so just be aware when it came to the miniature one, I pressed the seams open. Let me take this guy down. Do, 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 do. I actually pressed the seams open. And you can see I still got some of the paper on there. Ooh, what a problem, right? Um, I pressed the seams open. And the difficulty there is getting the, it, the intersections to match up. Um, so using pins, I'm able to get those intersections to match up quite nicely. The reason I did it with the miniature is it's just so, so bulky. Um, to press to one side, even here, I mean, it ends up being like eight pieces of fabric. So you might want to consider all of it being pressed open, no matter what size you're making. I don't generally press my blocks open. I don't like that. It's not my favorite method by any means whatsoever. And the reason I don't like it is with the seams pressed open, the longevity of that quilt, I think, is in jeopardy. With a miniature quilt, yeah, it's going to sit on the wall forever and ever and ever. Not a big deal. But with a bed quilt that's going to be used and washed, if the only thing holding that together is those center threads, that can make the longevity of the quilt maybe be in jeopardy. Right? So that's the end of the quilting, the processes for making the quilt. But I do want to talk to you a little bit about the designing of the quilt. So I did, there it is. I did this on electric quilt. So for those of you that are design level members, um, this is the one that I designed on electric quilt. And I want to talk to you a little bit about coloring. So when you look at these, this is the twin size. This is the queen size. And then I did some miniatures. So this is the one that represents an electric quilt, what I made, my little miniature version of it. And it's okay, but look at this next color. Do you see the difference? Look at how this one, you actually can see these moving. Whereas on the previous one, it looks more like a square and a square. That dark purple is just too dark. I shouldn't have done that dark purple there. Here, I swapped it so that the black is in the points of the star and the black is going around the center of the large ones and the small ones. So look at here. This is what I did. I had the black on the outside edges. I had the black in the inside of the sashings. This is what I think I like better. So this would be the colorization that I would maybe go with if I were you. Um, if you are making the quilt and you want a picture of this, I can send you this one. So, but here's some other versions. This is going to be a doll quilt version. And again, playing with the colors. And you can do that in electric quilt before you sew a stitch. And I say that, do you think that I did this? I did, but I just didn't play with it enough. Because look at how different that looks. Look at how you can see the blue stars now. Let me go back one. Yeah. You can't really see it as much. But when you did it, when I did it with the white here, here and here, it made that star pop out. So the light color or dark color here, here, and there. And then here's just some other ones that I played with. I really do like this one too. I love that orange in it. And then this would be the quid, crib size version. And here is another colorway. In the pattern, I actually give you a blank one that you can actually do your own color and pull out your color pencils from when the coloring thing was all a craze and you too can do all of the coloring that you want. So I just wanted to show you that so that you got, got kind of got some ideas on some different color options. The pictures that were at the beginning, if you were here at the very beginning, it was scrolling through. Some of those were ones I made. Some of those were just off of electric quilt. One of them was from one of our viewers, Linda, that made it so that the stars were diamonds. I actually threw her picture in. Thank you very much, Linda. I really appreciated that. Um, so just lots of different options. And with I think that with the Storm at Sea, the color really makes a big difference as to how much movement you're going to get. So maybe before you start making one, you jump on Pinterest, type in Storm at Sea quilts and be way overwhelmed with the thousands and thousands of Storm at Sea quilts that are out there. So there you go. 
all set. I hope you like this little one. Um, went a little bit long, but I had a lot of information to give you. A lot out there on different papers piecing and different tools that you can use for this paper piecing and many other ones. If you're looking for any of the tools, um, you can contact firesidequilts.com. So that's my friend Laura, and her email is laura at firesidequilts.com, and you can find that on her website too. So if I mention something and she doesn't have it in stock, just let her know, and bada boom, bada bing, you will have it in stock. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, those of you who, those of you who are, that's hard to say, who are members. I really, truly appreciate your membership. If you're interested in membership, there is a link below that tells you a little bit more about membership and the different levels. And pretty much the long and the short of it is it makes it so that I can keep doing this. So if you would enjoy my videos and you want to see more of them, consider being a member. I know it's not for everybody, um, but it just does make it possible for me to keep doing what I'm doing. Thank you very much for watching and have a great evening.